More than 30 years ago, a United Airlines DC-10 crashed at Sioux City Airport on July 19th, 1989. 112 of the 296 passengers and crew were killed. However, to this day, United 232 is viewed as an ideal example of successful crew resource management. Let us look back at the accident and discover why. United Airlines 232 departs Denver's Stapleton Airport on July 19, 1989 at 14.09 Central Time, carrying 285 passengers and 11 crew. The aircraft's takeoff weight is 369,000 pounds. The flight is bound for Philadelphia International, with a stopover in Chicago. With a routine takeoff and climb, the DC-10 levels off at its cruise altitude of 37,000 feet maintaining Mark 0.83, 83% of the speed of sound. At this point in the flight, the crew can sit back and relax. The high workload period of the takeoff and climb is complete, and there is still a fair amount of time before they begin preparing for the approach into Chicago. The first officer is at the controls for this sector. William Records is 48 and has approximately 20,000 hours of flight time. In command is Captain Alfred Haynes, 57, also highly experienced with almost 30,000 hours, while the flight engineer, Dudley Dvorak, has 15,000 hours but is new to the DC-10, with just 33 hours on the type. The McDonnell Douglas DC-10-10 is a trijet style aircraft, equipped with General Electric aircraft engines. The plane was delivered in 1971 and has operated for 43,401 flight hours. All three engines hum along consistently in the cruise, with each capable of producing 41,000 pounds of thrust. However, deep within the tail-mounted number two engine is a defect. What started out as a tiny imperfection on the fan disc during the initial manufacturing of the engine has grown slowly over time into a half-inch long crack, and it is about to have dire consequences. What was that? Sounded like an explosion. What are the engine instruments showing? It looks like we've lost number two. Okay, engine shutdown checklist, please. The flight crew successfully identify the failure as the number two engine. The captain has directed the flight engineer to perform the engine shutdown checklist, but as he commences the procedures, he discovers that the issue may be more than a standard engine failure. Hang on. All of our hydraulic quantities are indicating zero. That can't be right. It's turning right, guys. Uh, I can't stop it. My controls? It's not responding. I'm reducing thrust on number one. With the plane not responding to flight control inputs and the aircraft rolling right, the captain reduces thrust on the left engine. This decreases the lift being produced by the left wing and stops the roll to the right allowing the aircraft to regain a wing's level attitude. The engine failure which has occurred is an uncontained engine failure, meaning that parts of the engine have been ejected with the explosion. Some of these parts had enough energy to penetrate and sever two of the three hydraulic lines in the horizontal stabilizer, while the third hydraulic system, powered by the number two engine itself, was destroyed by the force of the explosion. With the loss of all hydraulic systems, the flight crew now face an extremely challenging situation. Hydraulic power is vital to many key aircraft systems, including the landing gear, flaps, and primary flight controls. The pilots need to find a way to control the aircraft and land as soon as possible. What's the hydraulic quantity? Down to zero. On all of them? All of them. Quantity. Is quantity gone? Yeah, all the quantity is gone, all the pressure is gone. A United Czech captain, who is traveling as a passenger, comes into the cockpit and describes what he saw. Okay, both your inboard ailerons are sticking up. That's as far as I can tell. I don't know what's happening. None of the control surfaces are moving. Yeah, we're at maximum turn right now. What I need is elevator control. We're down to 17,000 feet. I've tried the autopilot, but it won't work. It won't work, okay? The Czech captain takes control of the throttles and begins to gain some command over the plane. He uses asymmetric power to stop the aircraft's tendency to turn to the right, and as it descends into thicker air, he is also able to arrest the rapid descent. Alright, 
Good job. My name's Al Haynes. Hi, Al. Denny Fitch. How do you do, Denny? I'll tell you what. I'll have a beer when this is all done. Well, I don't drink, but I'll sure as well have one. How are they doing on the evacuation? They're putting things away, but they're not in any hurry. Well, they better hurry. We're gonna have to ditch, I think. With the crew regaining control of the plane, air traffic control identifies Sioux City Airport as a potential spot for an emergency landing. United 232 Heavy, can you hold that present heading, sir? Where's the airport now? We're turning around in circles. United 232 Heavy, CO City is about 12 o'clock and 36 miles. Okay, we're trying to go straight in. We're not having much luck. Okay, we got denser air. Should get level flight back. Whatever you've got. It's looking a little better. It seems controllable, doesn't it? Yeah, the lower you get, the more dense the air is. The better it is. I'll tell you what. We're putting this thing into Sioux City. Sioux City, United 232. Could you give us, please, your ILS frequency, the heading, and the length of the runway? United 232. The frequency is 109.3. It'll take a heading of 2.30 to get on it. Okay, we've got a little bit more control back now. How long is your runway? 2.32 heavy? The runway is 9,000 feet long. With the plane now flying towards Sioux City, the crew turned their attention to reducing their speed. Even on a 9,000 foot long runway, a landing simply won't be possible at their current speed. Ah, uh, start dumping fuel, will ya? Just hit the quick dump. Let's get the weight down as low as we can. Okay, yeah, I uh, didn't have time to think about that. This thing wants to go right more than wants to go left, doesn't it? Yeah, start easing the power back. Okay, nose is coming up. Yeah, we're going up. Coming back, coming back. Right now, power is coming back in. Is this Sioux City down to the right? That's Sioux City. There are no procedures for this type of failure. Losing all three hydraulic systems is considered to be such a rare event that it is not even addressed in the aircraft's manual. The crew have managed to get the plane into a somewhat desirable state, however. They are tracking towards the runway at Sioux City, where they will attempt a landing. Can't think of anything we haven't done. Anything you can think of? The only thing I can think that might help you at some point is to put the landing gear down. That might hold the nose down a bit. When you get turned to that 240 heading, sir, the airport will be about 12 o'clock and 38 miles. Okay, we're trying to control it just by power alone now. We have no hydraulics at all, so we're doing our best here. Roger. And we've notified equipment out in that area, sir. It's standing by. Captain Haynes now turns his attention to the cabin. He briefs the lead flight attendant and makes a PA to the passengers, detailing the procedures for the brace position and evacuation. He then sends the flight engineer into the cabin to assess the damage on the tail of the aircraft. Up until this point, the engineer has been busy talking to United Maintenance on the aircraft's second radio. The leaning edge is damaged. I mean from what I can see, I don't know how much there is I can't see. The crew have a detailed discussion regarding the landing gear and brakes. They realise that braking will be extremely limited after landing due to the lack of hydraulics. Following this, all five flight crew work to get the plane descending towards the runway, still using engine power as the primary control of the plane. They put the landing gear down, but struggle to control its effect on the aircraft's flight profile. We rejoin the crew as they make their final approach to the runway. United 232, the airport is currently at your one o'clock position, 10 miles. Ease it down, ease it down. It's off to the right over there. Right there, let's see if we can hold 500 feet a minute. Ah, that's the runway right there. We've got the runway in sight, we'll be with you shortly. Thanks a lot for your help. United 232, you are clear to land on any runway. <laughs> you want? You want me to be particular and make it a runway, huh? Two minutes! The flight attendants begin shouting for the passengers to get their heads down and brace, with landing imminent. We want to go down. Well, I got it. I got to keep control. See if you can turn left just a bit. Left turn just a hair. Don't sink. 
I'll put spoilers Don't on the sink. touch. And try Don't to get sink. the brakes with me. Don't sink. United Don't 232, sink. sir. Don't That's sink. the closed runway, but Don't it'll sink. work. Don't How sink. long is it? It's 6,600 feet. Don't sink. Don't sink. Don't Pull the power back. That's right. Pull the left one back. Pull the left one back. Left throttle. Left, left, left. God! With the aircraft just seconds from touching down, the right wing begins to drop and descent rate increases. Despite the crew's best efforts to control the descent with thrust, the plane crashes slightly left of the runway threshold, skidding to the right and rolling inverted. Firefighting and rescue operations respond immediately, but the aircraft is destroyed by the impact and fire. 35 passengers die of smoke inhalation, 24 of traumatic injuries, and 53 of blunt force injuries. Despite the circumstances, an evacuation is executed, and 185 of the 296 people on board survive the crash, many though with serious injuries. Let's go back and look at how all this started. A crack in the number 2 engine's fan disc led to an uncontained engine failure severely damaging all three hydraulic systems. The National Transport Safety Board investigated the origins of the crack. A tiny defect likely occurred in the initial manufacturing of the engine, and as the engine progressed throughout its lifetime, this microscopic cavity was a stress razor which allowed a fatigue crack to be created. The crack was just half an inch long, but even cracks of this size would usually be picked up by maintenance in routine checks. The fan disc had been through six inspections throughout its lifetime, with the last occurring one year prior to the accident. The accident report sets out several possibilities of why it wasn't discovered. One such explanation being that the central area of the disc was given less attention than other crack-prone areas. Losing all three hydraulic systems presented an extremely challenging situation to the flight crew. This type of failure is virtually never practiced in the simulator, due to its likelihood being so remote. What did help the crew though, was their effective crew resource management skills. CRM skills describe how a pilot effectively manages a situation through the use of tools such as leadership, communication, and aircraft knowledge. If effectively done, it can lead to vastly superior decision making and situational awareness, especially in emergency and non-normal situations. The crew of United 232 provided an excellent example of these key skills. Just some examples are as follows. The captain accepted the check captain's assistance in the cockpit, who provided a vital role all the way to landing. The interaction between the fly crew was positive, thoughtful, yet assertive. All key components of effective communication in a non-normal situation. While not shown in the scope of this video, communication was widened by the efforts of the flight engineer, who spent most of the accident sequence in discussion with United Maintenance on the aircraft's second radio. These resource management skills allowed good decisions to be made and situational awareness to be maintained. It was only in the last seconds of the flight that the damaged aircraft was too much for the crew to handle. The NTSB's report praised the crew's role in the accident. In simulator reenactments of the flight, it found that achieving a controlled landing with all hydraulic systems lost was virtually impossible. The probable cause of the accident was in relation to human factors though. It stated that inadequate consideration was given to the human factors limitations regarding the inspection and quality control of the engine. Despite the best efforts of the crew, 112 people died in the accident of United 232. It is a classic example of crew resource management however, and to this day is one of the most prominent and talked about accidents in aviation.